Hello, we're here with Representative Noel Frame, who is running for re-election for a state representative position number one. Would you like to go ahead with your two minute introduction? I sure would, thank you, Nicole. Um, well, good evening, everyone. Um, as mentioned, I'm Representative Noel Frame, and I've had the privilege of being your state representative um, since 2016, so four and a half years now. For those of you who don't know me, I have been a resident of the 36 now for 15 years, which is crazy. It's, I can't believe it's been that much time and a lifelong resident of Washington State. You know, it is such a privilege to serve you. And I'll tell you the reason it is, is because I feel like I get to work on um, public policy that's important to the, the district as a whole, public policy that I'm pers personally passionate about, but also public policy for individual constituents um, who bring ideas to me. Um, so in the biggest picture sense, I'll say that one of the top issues for our district is uh, finally addressing um, our regressive and upside down tax code. And that has been a big focus of my work and privilege to have helped to create and now serving as the co-chair of the bipartisan bicameral tax structure work group. And I'm sure we'll have some discussion about that. I'm also very passionate about issues around child welfare, behavioral health, juvenile justice, and I've had tremendous success in the last several years passing major public policy on those um, you know, policies affecting our young people in particular, um, and also serving in the role as the co-chair of the Children's Mental Health Work Group, just renamed the Children and Youth Behavioral Health Work Group, passing many pieces of legislation through that. And that really comes, that passion comes from my lived experience um, as a foster parent to kids in my own family. Finally, it's really been such a privilege um, to bring forward the ideas of our constituents. Um, we have passed several pieces of legislation the last couple of years that were ideas from constituents of ours. Uh, Jeff Manson, who is on this call, um, brought forward to me the fact that our administrative law judges um, in a certain part of the government were not allowed to collectively bargain. It was unfair and it was being reflected in their wages. We brought that bill forward and that bill passed and they are now set to start bargaining. Uh, Sean Bickley brought forward legislation to end uh, subminimum wage for people with disabilities, passed legislation to get a first step there. Uh, Peggy Dolane brought forward legislation to help and empower parents to be involved in the behavioral health services for their teenage children who were so ill they couldn't really even see that they needed help. And is that time? We, I can't tell. Okay. I can't see Laura, so that's my, my feedback in the moment. Um, and then the last statement, um, I'll say um, Liz Trotman in her capacity at uh, Mockingbird Society, who is also a constituent, um, brought forward legislation that she wanted to end the use of detention for non-criminal offenses for young people, non-criminal offenses like running away from home or skipping school. Um, these were very heavy lifts, and it was my privilege to provide a platform to the constituents of the 36 districts to pursue policies that they're passionate about. So I'm looking forward to continuing to serve. I feel like the why you should reelect me is I have proven myself to be an effective legislator. I am um, set up to be in positions where I can really start to move structural change um, and excited to take on that work. So thank you so much for this opportunity. Great, thank you. Um, so now we're gonna move to the four prepared questions and I see that Robert has posted them here into the chat for us. Um, thank you for that. Uh, these responses are two minutes apiece, and we're gonna go in the order of Laura, Jeff, Lori, then Summer. Um, so Laura, would you be willing to take question one? Nicole, can I ask one clarifying question before? So who is keeping time? Because I don't have, I can't see it. Sure, Laura is. And she'll um, pop in and say 30 seconds. And you'll, you'll audibly say 30 seconds. Yes. Okay, for, it won't let me pin the video. So uh, okay. Challenge. Okay, very good though. Thank you for the clarification. Yep, no problem. Okay. Washington State is facing a significant decline in revenues due to the impact of the coronavirus. Do you pledge to vote against closing this deficit with budget cuts? What taxes will you look to rise or raise in order to deal with this crisis? Sure, um, thanks for the question. So um, I believe, and I'm just gonna, this is my statement of what I think the situation is going to be. I think it is going to be a combination of budget cuts. I'm just gonna be really clear. Um, I think it will be that. I think it will be accessing the budget stabilization account, uh, our rainy day fund, and I think it is revenue. Um, I think if I were to sit here and tell you 
that I will not vote for any cuts at all. Um, it would be disingenuous and I would have to go back on my word because there will be something, even if it's $5, um, which it wouldn't be $5. But um, it would be disingenuous for me to say I'm not going to vote for a budget that has cuts in it because I have no doubt I will be presented with an option to vote for a budget that has some degree of cuts in it. What I will be doing is I will be fighting to access the budget stabilization account in a huge way. Um, I hope that we will convene the special session in a time period where we expect that we will only need a simple majority vote for the budget stabilization account and not the normal 60 percent um, because of um, the economic triggers that happen in the rules that we have. Finally, not only am I going to hopefully vote for new revenue, I am fighting internally for it right now. I am meeting with stakeholders. I am talking about options. I am talking about progressive taxes, uh, like wealth taxes, that could generate revenue right now. Um, I've obviously very thanks. I'm supportive of capital gains. It's not going to generate money right now, but we're trying to think creatively about how to do that. I'm looking at things like a state tax and inheritance tax, but also some really potential innovative solutions around bonding that might help us get revenue in a way that we hadn't thought of before. Um, and this is all towards special session. Um, I'm not even speaking to my plans for the January full session um, when we could look at structural reform. Great, thank you. Uh, question two, Jeff. The coronavirus crisis has led to thousands of Washingtonians losing their health insurance when they lost their jobs at a moment when healthcare is more important than ever. Do you support moving to a state-based Medicare for All system? Thanks for the question. I most certainly do, and I've been a consistent co-sponsor of the legislation um, to for the Washington Healthcare Security Trust, sort of our pathway to Medicare for All. Um, the most recent form that that has taken is a work group that's really doing the thoughtful, smart work of costing out um, th and thinking through the logistics of how to do that. If I've learned anything at the, in the legislature in my four and a half years, uh, details really matter and having done the foundational work it will take to just have more than a policy statement, but actually a plan to implement it is critical. Um, and of course, I'm very proud of our 36th district, Nicole Gomez, who's on this call, Bevan McLeod. Um, with the Alliance for a Healthy Washington are really leading that work as citizen ad advocates and activists. And as I said in my introduction, I think one of the great joys of my job is I can provide a platform to members of my district and other passionate citizen advocates to advance things that they care about. So I will continue to partner with Bev and Nicole, the Alliance for a Healthy Washington and others um, to do whatever I can to move to Medicare for All or kind of universal health care, however we want to name it for our state. Thanks for the question. Thank you. Uh, question three, Lori. Well, you touched on this in an earlier answer, but what is your plan for dealing with Washington State's regressive upside down tax code? Will you lead on taxing large corporations and wealthy individuals? Do you support a progressive income tax, a capital gains tax, a more robust estate tax, and a tax on companies paying excessive compensation to some employees? So I have two minutes to answer this question. Okay because I could go out for 10 years. Okay, so not only will I lead, I am leading. So I mentioned earlier, I created and I'm now co-chairing the tax structure work group. Uh, we got $2 million in the state budget to start to lay the foundation for that work in this biennium. Um, and what is happening right now is the Department of Revenue is doing economic modeling for a huge punch list of analysis I've asked them to do. The B&O tax is a, a, a tax on gross receipts for business. It is incredibly regressive for small startup and low margin businesses. The largest corporations in this state have gotten themselves preferences and other exemptions, so they just don't have to pay B&O at the same rate that others do, obviously Boeing being chief among them. Um, and the most recent bill that came forward to, to deal with Boeing's tax break, I was a no vote on that one um, in my commitment to hold them and other large corporations accountable. Um, so I will have four alternatives to B&O modeled. I'm also modeling a flat and progressive income tax. I support a progressive income tax. We are going to need to um, overturn the constitutional um, aspect of the uniformity clause with the Seattle income tax lawsuit losing. Um, we are going to have to overturn the uniformity clause in the state constitution to be able to achieve that. It's a big lift, but it's something that I think is worth considering for a whole host of reasons, not just the income tax piece. Um, 30 seconds. Thank you. So in the process that we put forward in the tax structure work group, this year was for analysis. And the next two years was really about community engagement. 
and really building the political will and figuring out the details for what proposal we would bring forward. Um, I believe that this COVID-19 crisis, if it gets worse than it is already, um, it may create the political will that we never thought we would have this soon. And I am so happy that I have led and have created a process where we will have the data available to us that potentially we could move towards large structural reform in the 2021 session. Hi. Um, political will is there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Summer, question four. Taking myself off unmute. Uh, and question four is Do you support efforts to combat the economic impacts of systemic racism by supporting laws that tar target inequality in areas like housing, education, and intergenerational wealth? Please provide examples of such laws that you would uh, advocate for and lead on. Great. Thank you so much for the question. And what I will speak to right now in, in terms of ex, uh, examples of the laws that I would support and what I have supported, because I think they really do impact all of the, the aspects of housing, education, intergenerational wealth, et cetera. Um, I have spent a tremendous amount of time in my time as your state representative working on criminal justice reform with a really special focus on young people. Um, if we can get our criminal justice system right, um, when young people are first touching the system, they are less likely um, to be in that revolving door of the criminal justice system for the rest of their lives. Um, two pieces of legislation that are my proudest accomplishment, frankly didn't even have my name on them, but that I'm the one doing the work behind the scenes and I know that and that's all that matters, is undoing 20 years of bad public policy, um, what were called auto decline laws. Uh, laws that for 16 and 17 year old kids that were called super predators, black and brown kids, this was the most racist criminal justice policy some of the most racist criminal justice policy our nation has ever seen, automatically declining those kids from juvenile systems and convicting them as adults. We undid that policy. Um, that policy was 70% kids of color were going into the criminal justice system through auto decline. Um, and overall, um, in our criminal justice system today, in our deepest end of the juvenile justice system, 90% of the kids are kids of color. If that's not a racist system, I don't know what is. Um, I have been working with kids who are incarcerated and letting them lead the way. 30 seconds. Um, thank you. Um, and so I think that is a really good example of what I have done. And I will tell you what I'm doing right now. Um, right now in the middle of the COVID-19 crisis, as we have heard on the national level, uh, things like the payroll protection program um, were not put together through a racial or social equity lens. And you've got large corporations like Shake Shack now giving back $10 million out of shame um, because uh, small and independent businesses, particularly owned by women and people of color, could not access those funds as we are crafting a solution from the state aspect. I am advocating loudly and clearly advocating for um, women, minority, immigrant, and minority owned businesses. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, and now we're uh, able to go to follow up questions. Um, the responses to these are one minute apiece and uh, if anybody would like to ask a question, raise your hand or message me in the box. Sometimes it takes a little while. Robert, go ahead. Yep, thank you. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, so I'm curious about the you know upcoming special session that might happen and how we change the narrative seems to be emerging that you know there's gonna have to be some cuts. Um, would you be open to pushing some more creative solutions, such as longer term borrowing or you know, eliminating rules that require a four year balance budget that I think actually Republicans impose on us? Is it yeah. time to really think creatively, even just to get us through the near term without hurting too many more people? Yeah, absolutely. And again, this isn't just me saying I'm going to do this, I'm actively doing it right now. Um, so as a member of the finance committee, and I, I'm going to be just really transparent, I hope to chair the finance committee next year uh, with my seatmate, Representative Tarleton, um, uh, stepping away from her role as state representative to run for secretary of state. She leaves that chairmanship open. Um, I am absolutely pursuing that chairmanship so that I can be in the key position within the state house to change the narrative. Um, so creative, pardon? 30, 30 seconds. seconds. Thanks. So Robert, to your question about like, am I open to thinking about changing the narrative? Yes, and I am. Um, am I open to creative solutions? Yes, and I am. I've met with the stakeholders. I'm bringing the ideas forward. Those conversations are happening internally. 
um, and I'm leading internal groups both um, on, on this tax policy overall and specific tax policy review uh, preparing for the special session. Thanks for the question. Thank you. Summer, go ahead. Uh, this is Summer, and my question is, you've talked a lot about the um, looking at it, you know taxes and how to the special work group and mm -hmm. gathering input but what can we do to move that up for the special session and actually have those taxes ready to go or plan ready to go for the special session that's likely to happen in June yeah so structural change will not happen in the June special session and I'm just going to state that plainly and clearly when I the way that I talk about structural change we may get some progressive taxes but it's not going to be the structural change that I mean and, and part of that guys is just we don't even know if we're going to convene in person we don't know if we're going to have regular committees there's a lot of questions that are really up in the air right now that um, I, we just don't know what our situation is going to be so I'm looking at and as I said to stakeholders Really, thank you. Really narrow taxes that are progressive but could generate revenue right now, not two years from now, like capital gains. Right? I love capital gains, but it's not going to generate money for us right now in this crisis. Um, and then, um, what you can do is just push for that structural reform in the 2021 session. I hope the political will is there, but if it is not, as I did not plan for it to be in 2021, the rest of the tax structure work group public process will already be in motion. Great, thank you. Uh, Jason, you're next. Uh, yes, um, legislator Bob Hoskawa has been talking about a state bank and mm -hmm. it could be, you know, a, a good solution for some of the physical um, deficits we've had uh, in the state. And um, I don't know where we're on the, um, in that topic, but could you elaborate on some of your thoughts on it? Yeah, thanks, Jason. Um, I'm, I'm supportive of a state bank. And in fact, um, in uh, past biennium, Prime sponsored um, the companion bill to Senator Hasegawa's Senate bill. Um, I have chosen just in terms of division of responsibilities that there are other legislators who are focusing on the state bank work while I'm focusing on the tax policy work. Um, so in addition to Senator Hasegawa, Senator Wellman and Senator Cooter have been pushing on that work. I, I will say admittedly, I think there was a little bit of a flub in um, the work getting executed, whether intentional or not. So I don't think we quite have the business plan that we were hoping that we would have. I know that Senator Hasegawa had a provision in the budget to I think try to re jumpstart that and it was one of the things that got vetoed in the cuts. So Jason, I'm not quite sure actually where we are right now. I am supportive of the idea. Um, I am just focusing my energy on the tax policy piece of the solution as opposed to the bank side of the solution, but supportive if they can move that all forward. Thank you. Uh, Brittany. Uh, in light of the passage of I-976 and the aforementioned COVID-related budget crisis, what can we do to protect transit and other environmentally friendly modes of transportation yeah. at the state level? Great, great question. Um, so I will say as part of my overall work on tax policy, you know, I never really plan to have the transportation piece as part of the tax structure work group. Um, but recognizing after post-976 that I really needed to better understand what was happening there. Um, I do believe that a transportation package will be brought forward in the 2021 session. I know that our constitutional provisions around um, the specific uses of gas tax are a very limiting factor for us, and it may finally be time uh, to overturn those constitutional requirements so that we have uh, a, broader, thank you, a broader based funding source for transit. Um, I know that Representative Jake Fai, who is chairing transit, along with several other legislators, are thinking about um, and think, just thinking about really restructuring transportation taxes in general so that we have more flexibility for transit. So at the state level, Brittany, I think that that's probably the best solution right now. Um, and again, it's kind of like they've got one sandbox, I've got another, but we are talking and coordinating so I know what's happening there. Um, and it might be the pay, pay by mile stuff, but I think more importantly, it's probably kind of what are our regular sources that we use and we allow them to use for transit, not just roads. Thank you. Thanks. All right, uh, Sherry. Hi, um, I uh, would like to know if you have any strategies that you think would work to finally abolish the death penalty. I know there's been a, um, a really um, emotional argument um, 
that seems to hold it back every year, or at least that's what I've been led to understand. And um, seeing how it's effectively not enforceable, I have trouble with that argument, but I was wondering what. Um, honestly, if I'm giving you my honest strategy, my number one recommendation is to elect a Democrat to replace Jenny Graham in the sixth district. I like Jenny Graham. I, I try to work with her. It is very hard to have a logical data informed conversation uh, with somebody who understandably leads from personal experience and from their heart. Um, but as is so true for so much of the criminal justice work that I have done, I can't fight people who don't rely on facts and choose to ignore facts. Um, and I think with Jenny in particular, it's not just her. Um, I think we all have a tremendous um, uh, empathy and respect for her lived experience. And I think for those of us that support the, there are people that support the policy um, that simply will not engage uh, because we've got somebody who can't separate their advocate hat and their lived experience from good public policy um, to overturn a racist uh, public policy. Great, thank you. We appreciate your responses. Um, and since we are very close to time, would you like to go ahead and give a, a quick wrap up uh, about a minute? Sure. Um, so as always, thank you to the 36 district Democrats for this opportunity. Um, I'm always in awe of the process and appreciate you sharing this interview, this video with voters more broadly. Um, we've all been in this a long time together and I will just say, you know, People look at me and the work that I get to do and they're like, God, you got to do all this fun stuff and how can you spend so much time on tax policy? And I'm like, this is what my district wants me to do. Um, I think I am a, a good reflection of, of the values of our district, the hardworking values of our district. We all put our boots on the ground, do the work. I'm excited for this election. I have not drawn an opponent yet and rest assured, I will do everything I can to support swing districts across the state, um, both through fundraising and door knocking. If we're ever allowed to door knock again, but not past August because I'm having a baby and uh, I think I better not go door knock with a, an infant right away. Um, so my hope is that I will get to carry that forward, our 36 district values of helping other Democrats across the state. So thanks for the opportunity and uh, have a good evening, I guess. Thank you very much.